So we have been on a long journey. Nevertheless, it's been more a distance of time as we have spanned 6,000 years to today as we journey to Bethlehem, 4,000 years from Eden to Bethlehem where Jesus was born. 4,000 years from Adam and Eve to the story of the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. And today, there are some really interesting pieces of this story that are often not told, and I hope to be able to do that for you as we do this. What I have done is taken a harmony of the Gospels written and translated in the New Living Testament that puts the story of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of the birth of Jesus, really it's mostly Luke and Matthew that does this, the birth of Jesus, the shepherds, the wise men, those stories, we, it puts them together in a chronological order so we can actually read that in a very easy to understand language and even our kids should be able to understand it as we read it. And as we go through this story, I'm going to read it to you. But as we go through it, I'm going to comment about some of the things that have touched my heart as I have recounted the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. Last week, we ended up in Hebron, where Abraham and Sarah were buried in the cave of Machpelah. And not only Abraham and Sarah, but Isaac and Rebekah are buried there. And I'd like to show you a map just because I want you to be able to see where this place is in relationship to Bethlehem. If you will look on this map, you will see a little town called Hebron. I know the picture is just a tiny bit fuzzy, but down in the middle, lower portion of this picture is a little red dot with the, with the name Hebron on it. And this place is in the hills of Judea. And this is where the cave of Machpelah is actually located, where Abraham and Sarah were buried, where Isaac and Rebekah were buried, where Jacob and Leah were buried. And on this map, if you go way up to the top in the middle, you will see a place called Sychar, and that's where Rachel is buried. Remember, Jacob had a very deep love in his heart for Rachel, and she was the love of his life, and Leah was the one that was given to him first by Laban. But Rachel died earlier in our story, and she is buried up in the area of Sychar. But the rest of that family was all buried in Hebron. And that town is going to be very important to us as we read this story today. So let's look at this story. And you may want to look along in your Bibles, or you may want to just listen, because I'm not going to be giving references. This comes from Luke and Matthew and their composite story of the birth of Jesus. And so let's read together. It says, It all begins with a Jewish priest, Zacharias, who lived when Herod was king of Judea. Zacharias was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commands. They had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and now they were very old, both of them. Where did Zacharias and Elizabeth live? They lived in the hills of Judea. They lived in a town in the country hills of Judea. They lived in Hebron. Hebron was a very important place for the people of God and the, the patriarchs. That's where we ended our journey with Abraham in our study previously. It's also where Zacharias and Elizabeth lived. And Zacharias and Elizabeth were the parents of who? John the Baptist. So John the Baptist comes from this area and this is where our story 
begins for today. We're going to pick up Zacharias and Elizabeth and John the Baptist on our way to the manger of Bethlehem. And also Herod, who Herod was actually a foreign king of Judea. And why is that important to us? That is important to us because there's a prophecy in the book of Genesis that I would like to read to you, which tells us what the conditions were and what the timing was of when Jesus was to be born. And in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, Moses in Genesis gives us this prophecy. It says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh, that is Jesus, comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. So Herod was actually ruling, and the scepter had departed from Judah. It was not a, a, an, a king of Israel that was ruling when Herod ruled. It said in the prophecy that the scepter would not depart from Judah, that is from Israel, from, from the people of Israel. It would not be, depart from Judah until Shiloh comes, that is Jesus Christ. So the fact that Herod was king at this time is an indication that Jesus' time to appear among the people as the Messiah had come. So let's look at these, these verses just a second again. It also says in there, and I want, I want to make a point of this because the gospel story is so important as we study this, this picture today, as we look at this picture. The, the, it says that Zacharias and Elizabeth were righteous before God. That doesn't mean they were not sinners. They were, it does not mean that they were sinless. It means that they were blameless. And in fact, that is how it actually says it in the New King James Version. They were blameless. Noah was righteous before God, but Noah was not sinless. We know that from his story. But Noah was righteous before God. Many of the saints of Israel were righteous before God, but they were not sinless. They were just living lives that were consistent with their faith in God, and they were not involved in major scandals or anything that would cause them to be looked upon as uh, unrepresentative of the, the role that they were playing in the history and the life of the people of Israel. The reason that's important for me to say to you is because I want you to understand that, that God is not looking for sinlessness, this side of heaven in us. He wants people who are given over to him, who are seeking to follow his ways, who are seeking to live lives consistent with their faith, and that is what he is looking for in us. And that's what he found in Zacharias and Elizabeth. Another piece of this picture is that we can learn from this, that sometimes when we pray, and we will see that Zacharias had been praying that his wife would be able to have a child, Probably not at this point in life where we're reading this story, but in times past, we will see this in just a moment. But when we pray to God for something, God hears our prayers. He may not give us right now what he has to offer us, the blessing for which we uh, seek him, but God hears our prayers, and when the blessing comes in answer to our prayers, it becomes more precious to us because we've had to wait for it. Just like John the Baptist was a precious gift from God, and obviously it was a gift from God. It wasn't anything that Zacharias and Elizabeth could have done on their own, any more than Mary could have borne Jesus on her own. And so, or some of these other women who have had children, Isaac, for instance, being born to Sarah and Abraham. So some, one of the beautiful lessons of this story is that when we pray to God, he hears our prayers. If we're praying in faith, if we are looking to him, he listens to us. And, and even though he may not give us the gift at the time that we are asking, 
when he does respond to us, we know that it's because he is in the picture, that he is, his hand is moving on our behalf, and the blessing is double what it would have been otherwise, because we know that God has responded to our prayers. So let's continue the story. It says that one day Zacharias was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. The order of the priests was divided up into about 24 um, groups of people. And David had done this centuries before. This story is, is told. But David had actually taken the priests of Aaron, the, the Aaronic priesthood, and had divided them up into 24 groups so that, that when the temple needed being covered by priestly ministry, there was there were plenty of people to do it. And Zacharias, being of the the heritage of Aaron, was delegated to this particular week of duty. And it says, as was the custom of the priest, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary and burn incense in the Lord's presence. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. It's possible that this was actually a Sabbath day when Zacharias was offering because there were many people outside, it says, at this time. One Bible commentator by the name of Lightfoot says that it was probably a Sabbath day because of the crowd of people that were standing outside praying. And it says Zachariah, Zacharias was in the sanctuary when the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. You remember that in the most most holy place we had the uh, the Ark of the Covenant and the Shekinah uh, glory and the tablets of the Ten Commandments were inside this mercy, underneath the mercy seat. And there was a, a, a very thick veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And the priest only went in once a year. And that's the same veil, by the way, that was ripped from top to bottom when Jesus Christ offered his life for us. So Zacharias was spent standing before this veil where the altar of incense was, and the incense would rise up over as he prayed, as he prayed to God on behalf of the people that were outside and on behalf of his own uh, needs from God. And the incense would rise and would go over this tapestry into the most holy place where the presence of God was. And so as Zacharias, Zacharias is praying, the, an angel, it says, appeared to him on the right-hand side of the incense altar. And Zacharias was overwhelmed with fear. But the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zacharias, for God has heard your prayer, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You think Zacharias was praying for a child now? Probably not, because he was probably... He probably didn't expect that God would hear that prayer at the age that they were, him and his wife. And so, but listen, he had prayed this prayer before, obviously, because the angel says that, that God was about to answer his prayer for a child. This is another lesson in prayer. It's another opportunity for us to look in our own lives and realize that the prayers that we offer, God does not cast off. He holds those prayers in his memory. And as the right time comes along for us, he gives us that for which he have prayed. And that is exactly what happened to Zacharias on this day. It says, for God has heard your prayer and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you are to name him John. Why would, why would God, why would the angel ask him and tell him that he was to name this child that was to be born to them John. As, as we read this story, there was no one else in his family named John, and people often would name their children after others in their family, just as some do today. But Zechariah was not to name him after any of the other family, and he, the angel gave him the 
the instructions that he was to name the son that would come to him, John. So it says that he, the angel says to Zacharias, you will have great joy and gladness and many will rejoice with you at his birth for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or hard liquor and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his birth. And he will persuade many Israelites to turn to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. Remember who Elijah was in the Old Testament. He was the one that called fire down from heaven. And the fire that God sent in answer to his prayer was uh, it destroyed the the sacrifice and the altar and the water that had been poured over the altar and the wood that had been put under the sacrifice and and yet it destroyed all of that and it was it was a powerful moment as Elijah called Israel back to their God and it says here that he will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah the prophet of old and he will precede the coming of the Lord, preparing the people for his arrival. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will change disobedient minds to accept godly wisdom. So Zechariah said to the angel, How can I know this will happen? I am an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. And the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. Listen to me. Listen to who I am. I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring this good news to you. And now, since you didn't believe what I said, you won't be able to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly come true at the proper time. Something in this story makes me think this was not entirely a punishment for his unbelief at the words of the angel. Something tells me that this also would be something that would accompany the experience of not only Zacharias and Elizabeth, but the people around them. When Zacharias is unable to speak, it gets a lot of attention. Here's, here's a man who has been a priest and who has no doubt been instructing in the things of God, the people in his hometown of Hebron. And, and so when Zacharias cannot speak, not only is it a reminder to him that he needs to be, be a little more open to the word of God coming to him in this miraculous manner, but also it, 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 it makes the story bigger because now people notice and they, they will talk about it. And the birth of John the Baptist will be a grander event. And the birth of John the Baptist is the birth of one who will prepare the way of the Lord as Jesus comes. And so it just makes, it draws the attention of Israel to what is about to happen in the gift of God to them of a Messiah. So the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures that he must have seen a vision in the temple sanctuary. He stayed at the temple until his term of service was over, and then he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife, Elizabeth, became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. You know, women want to feel womanly, right? Men want to feel manly. And in those days, for a woman to have children was a very important sign of her womanhood. And it was a gift when God gave Elizabeth a child when she had been so long without one. Then the story continues, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel, in fact, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth. The same angel that had come to Zacharias is now going to Nazareth, a hundred miles north, a village in Galilee to a virgin named Mary. And she was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. 
Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. I want to pause just a moment to, to highlight a, a particular truth of this story right here. Mary and Joseph were both of the lineage of David. Remembered, Jesus was called Son of David. He was the Son of David. He had come through the ancestry that we have talked about for weeks now of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and then hundreds of years later through David and Bathsheba, who had Solomon, and, and after Solomon came those who would be the predecessors to the line of Christ. He would come through the house of David. And what was David? He was a king. What was Aaron, the heritage, the ancestors of Zacharias and Elizabeth? He was a priest. He was a priest, the high priest of Israel back in the wilderness. And it was of the lineage of Aaron and Levi, the, the priesthood, that Zacharias and Elizabeth both came. So the predecessor to Christ, John the Baptist, came from a priestly heritage. And the Son of God comes through a kingly heritage. In this story, we have the shadow of Christ as a high priest coming to us and the shadow of him being king of kings. And that's what he was called. There, remember on the day of his crucifixion, Pilate said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, I am. He was the king of the Jews. But there's even another twist to this story that is so interesting, and that is Elizabeth was a cousin of Mary who was of the lineage of David. And so Elizabeth and, and Mary were relatives. Mary was a, a cousin. Elizabeth was a cousin of Mary. And so Mary had not only, listen to this, Mary had not only the lineage of David in her line, but she had the priestly ministry that went along with it. And Jesus Christ is our high priest, and he is the king of kings. And so we find, you know what? God, God gives us these little pieces of information that show that he has thought way down the line of how he can make this picture so grand for us. And it's so beautiful when we dig below the surface of these stories, we can see these little details. Like, for instance, Hebron being a place where the patriarchs and their wives were buried, where they had come from. Abraham and Sarah were buried in Hebron, and it was right just a few miles away from Bethlehem. And David, of course, David, of course, grew up in Bethlehem. And he was a shepherd on the same hills that later in this story we see the shepherds shepherding their sheep. <laughs> it's, everything is connected, and it's such a grand and beautiful story as we look at all these pieces. So let's continue. Confused and disturbed as Mary sees Gabriel standing in front of her, Mary tried to think what the angel's presence could possibly mean. And the angel said to her, don't be frightened, Mary, for God has decided to bless you. You will become pregnant and have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. There's that Gabriel telling Mary what she is to name her son, as the angel Gabriel told Zacharias what name he was to give his son, John. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David. There you go. And he will reign over Israel forever. And his kingdom will never end. Do you know that the kingdom of God exists already in our earth, earth today? We live in a kingdom in which Christ is present and where he is, he is above all. He is the head of the church and the church the church, the mystical church of Jesus Christ, 
is the kingdom of God. It is where God reigns and rules and moves among his people. The kingdom of God is here. In fact, John the Baptist later says, as he begins his ministry, repent for the kingdom of God is near. What was he talking about? He was talking about Jesus coming and and the kingdom of God was established when Jesus Christ came. Jesus even said in one of his statements to the people, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, the kingdom of God has come to you. It is among you. It is here, he said. And I like to think of the cross of Jesus Christ being his flag in this earth's soil that established his kingdom long ago. And that kingdom still exists even in the earth today in the hearts and lives of his people and his church. And of course, we will experience the glory of that kingdom after Jesus returns to take us back home. And then Mary asked the angel in response to her, his statement to her, but how can I have a baby? I'm a virgin. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby born to you will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she's already in her sixth month of pregnancy. For nothing is impossible with God. And when God does the impossible, it makes us know that he is actively involved. Mary responded a little differently than Zacharias did, not entirely because she also asked the angel how, how she could possibly have a child when she was still a virgin. And the angel told her he, she did not have her speech taken away from her, but it's because her heart was so tender at that point, And she wasn't, she, maybe, maybe Zacharias was holding some bitterness in his heart. Who knows that God had not answered his prayer and given his wife a child. We don't know. But Zacharias lost his speech for a time <laughs> and Mary did not. Instead, her attitude was this. She said, I am the Lord's servant and I am willing to accept whatever he wants. May everything you have said come true. And the angel left. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zacharias lived and Elizabeth. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. And at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, You are blessed above all other women, and your child is blessed. What an honor this is that the mother of my Lord should visit you. We have no indication that Elizabeth had heard anything about the angel visit to Mary. All that God t told Zacharias is that his son, John, would be, would be great and that he would prepare the way for for the Lord who is to come. And here Mary shows up. And when she does, the Holy Spirit is active in Elizabeth. And it says that the child moved within her. And Elizabeth knew, somehow the Holy Spirit communicated to her that Mary was the mother of her Savior. When you came in and greeted me, my baby jumped for joy the instant I heard your voice. You are blessed, Mary, because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. So Mary responded with praise. And the next paragraph in this, in this story is the, the song of Mary as she praises God for his goodness and his greatness. And it says Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back to her own home. Now it was time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, and it was a boy. The word spread quickly to her neighbors, I guess so, and relatives that the Lord had been very kind to her, and everyone rejoiced with her. When the baby was eight days old, all the relatives and friends came for the circumcision ceremony. They wanted to name him Zacharias after his father, but Elizabeth said no. His name is John. What, they exclaimed? There is no one in your, all of your family by that name. 
So they asked the baby's father, communicating to him by making gestures. He motioned for a writing tablet, and to everyone's surprise, he wrote, His name is John. Instantly, Zacharias could speak again and began praising God. And wonder fell upon the whole neighborhood, and the news of what had happened spread throughout the Judean hills. Everyone who heard about it reflected on these events and asked, I wonder what this child will turn out to be. You see, the attention that God wanted was directed to to John, who would be introducing Christ to Israel. I wonder, they said, what this child will turn out to be, for the hand of the Lord is surely upon him in a special way. Then his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied before the people. He says, And you, my little son, <laughs> Zacharias, speaking to the baby, and you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High, because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the light from heaven is about to break upon us and to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the place of peace. And John grew up and became strong in spirit. Then he lived out in the wilderness until he began his public ministry to Israel. In this story, we find that Mary gives birth to Jesus six months after John is born. And they are cousins. And, uh, and yet they never saw one another until that day on the Jordan River when Jesus shows up. And John looks and he recognizes Jesus. And Jesus asks for John to baptize him. And John realizes that this is the Son of God, the one he has been telling the people was to come. So now the story moves to the story of Mary and Joseph. And it says, now this is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, didn't understand that the Holy Spirit was the reason for this. And being a just man, he decided to break the engagement quietly so as not to disgrace her publicly. Joseph had a good heart, but there were laws in Israel, and this was one that, that people would think had been broken, that Mary had, had illegitimately had this baby, had become pregnant. And as Joseph considered this about putting Mary away privately, it says he fell asleep and an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. But angels are busy these days, letting people know of the things that are coming and talking to them about the Messiah. The angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to go ahead with your marriage to Mary, for the child within her has been conceived of the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this happened to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, and she will give birth to a son. And he will be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. This is one of the things I want to talk about today. I want to talk about how Jesus' birth was, and it was God becoming flesh. It was God coming to us, becoming a part of our family that he might save us. It is God entering into our race, our family on earth, our humanity, and living with us every moment of every day through his spirit. Jesus came to us. He is God with us. And we are never alone. Never alone. He said he will never leave us or forsake us. He is always with us in everything that happens in our lives. Even if we can't see him, even if we don't know where he is in the picture, he is present because he came 
to be God with us. Emmanuel, that's what the prophecy says, and that's exactly what Jesus did. It says, when Joseph woke up, he did, did what the angel of the Lord commanded, and he brought Mary home to be his wife. But she remained a virgin until her son, Jesus, was born. At that time, during the reign of King Herod, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. First census. This is when Rome was actually fully in charge and ruling over Judea. This is when the scepter had fully departed. All returned to their own towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, as was Mary, by the way, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home, and he traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee, almost 90 miles or so away from Nazareth. And he took with him his wife, Mary, who was obviously pregnant at this time. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son, and she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the village inn. That night, some shepherds were in the fields outside the village of Bethlehem, where David used to shepherd sheep, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terribly frightened, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news of great joy for everyone. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born tonight in Bethlehem, the city of David, and this is how you will recognize him. You will find a baby lying in a manger, wrapped snugly in strips of cloth. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven. <laughs> We've studied that recently about the armies of heaven. Armies of heaven will be with Jesus once again when he comes the second time. But it says the armies of heaven were praising God. The angels couldn't keep quiet. They were so excited. And they were announcing to everyone who was listening the birth of the Savior. And they sang glory to God in the highest and peace on earth and goodwill to men. And when the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Come on, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this wonderful thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they ran to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was baby Jesus lying in a manger. Then the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary quietly treasured these things in her heart and thought about them often. And the shepherds went back to their fields and flocks, glorifying and praising God for what the angels had told them. And because they had seen the child, just as the angels had said, this was part of the plan of God to announce to the world that Jesus had come. And so Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem in Judea. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We have seen his star as it rose. And we have come to worship him. Where are these people coming from? These three wise men coming from? It says they are coming from the eastern regions. Could it be that they might have even been coming from the area in which Adam and Eve had first been given the promise of a Savior? It would be like God to do something like that, to have that connection with even with the, the area where Adam and Eve had been given the garden and where they had been given the promise of a savior. It says they came from the east. And if you'll recall on the map that we showed you before, that's where this journey began, is in the east. Herod was deeply disturbed by their question, as was all of Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law. He said, where did the prophets say that the Messiah would be born? 
in Bethlehem, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. Micah 5, 2. O Bethlehem of Judah, you are not just a lowly village in Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod sent a private message to the wise men, asking them to come see him. At this meeting, he learned the exact time when they first saw the star. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. Sure, Herod, of course, that's exactly what your intent is. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and once again the star appeared to them, guiding them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house where the child and his mother Mary were, and they fell down before him and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And I think rightly so, it is assumed that the gold represented the kingly role that Jesus would play. The frankincense would represent the priestly role. And the myrrh, which was bitter, would represent his sacrifice. But when it was time to leave, they went home another way because God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Eight days after the birth, when the baby was circumcised, Joseph named him Jesus. The name was given to the child by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for the purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered a sacrifice according to what was required in the law of the Lord. And there was a man by the name of Simeon who was waiting and watching. He lived in Jerusalem. He too was a righteous man. He too was living a blameless life before God and very devout. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and he eagerly expected the Messiah to come to Israel. The Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day the Spirit led him to the temple so when he saw Mary and Joseph come to present the baby Jesus, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Lord, now I can die in peace. As you promised me, I have seen the Savior you have given to all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Joseph and Mary were amazed at what was being said about Jesus. Can you imagine? Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, This child will be rejected by many in Israel, and it will be their undoing, but he will be the greatest joy to many others. How about to you? Thus the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, but a sword will pierce your very soul. Anna, the prophetess, was also there in the temple, and she was the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. Heritage was important in those days, and she was very old. She was a widow, for her husband had died when they had been married only seven years, and now she was 84 years old. She had never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God, and fasting and prayer. And she came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began to praise God. And she talked about Jesus to everyone who had been waiting for the promised king to come and deliver Israel. Now, after the wise men were gone, and this is the end of the story that we're covering today, after the wise men were gone and Jesus' parents had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, don't forget, Jesus did everything that the law requires of us because he had to be able to take our place in every way, even in baptism. For those who have never been able to be baptized, who never knew about the importance of baptism, Jesus was baptized on their behalf as well. Jesus did everything that is required of us so that he could give us credit for what he did in exchange for our faith in him. 
And it says, when he had fulfilled all the requirements of the law of the Lord, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up and flee to Egypt with the child and his mother and stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to try to kill the child. And that night, Joseph took Mary and Jesus and together all three of them went to Egypt and stayed there until the angel appeared to Joseph again and told him that Herod was dead and he could come back and that he was to go to Galilee. And that is the end of the very beautiful story of the birth of Jesus Christ. But it is not really because Jesus came to be born to us and he came to be born in us. He came to be born in us as well. Would you like him to be born in you? Yes. Raise your hand to him and say, Lord, come into my life and be born in me and give me new life. Let's pray together as we close. Father in heaven this morning, it's so good to hear that story once again. I pray that those who have listened and participated in the service today will experience, if they have not already, the birth of Jesus in their hearts and souls, that he may live, continue to live in them as a result of his birth in Bethlehem. I pray that all in Jesus' name. Amen.